World News Today, brought to you by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. The Allied Fifth Army in Italy has thrown back German counterattacks and has cut deeper into the enemy defense lines around Casino, the strategic town guarding the road to Rome. In Russia, Soviet armies have smashed within striking distance of three German escape railroads, and the fall of Sarny in old Poland appears imminent. British mosquito bombers were over German targets again last night. And in the far Pacific, marine jungle fighters on New Britain Island have made new gains in the face of strong Jap opposition. Now for our first news direct from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Winston Burdett reporting. We regret that we are not able to make contact with Columbia's correspondent in North Africa. However, for home front news, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Washington, Don Pryor reporting. Congress goes back to work tomorrow. You can't escape the feeling that it's going to be a tremendously important session. Certainly it will be racked with controversy because all the pent-up wartime pressures of the nation will be focused on Capitol Hill. Here are some of the issues that are, that are, that are waiting to be solved. Taxes. A bill providing a little over $2 billion, one-fifth as much as the Treasury asked for, is awaiting action in the Senate. Subsidies. By February 17th, there will have to be a showdown on the whole question of using subsidies to hold down the prices of food. The argument was postponed a bit by stopgap legislation adopted just before Congress went home for the holidays. Wages. The Senate has passed and the House is all ready to act on legislation which will give the non-operating railroad employees an arbitrary eight cents an hour increase in wages. And then there's the red-hot question of labor policy in general. The recent steel strike and the threatened railroad strike are certain to lead to demands for more stringent labor legislation. And then there will also have to be strong movement in favor of national service legislation, which in effect would be a labor draft. Last night, Major General Hershey of Selective Service announced that occupational deferments for men over under 22, whether they are fathers or not, will be curtailed sharply after the first of next month. War Mobilization Director Burns has announced the adoption of a uniform clause for war contracts to cover their termination. It's the first big step of the new Baruch organization in preparing for demobilization when the war is over. President Roosevelt's annual message is expected to go to Capitol Hill day after tomorrow, but we still don't know whether the president will deliver it in person. That's up to his personal physician, Rear Admiral McIntyre. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. More news in just a moment, but first, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Here in America, when a man's work is done, he can sit leisurely by his radio, perhaps an Admiral Radio, and listen with complete enjoyment to his favorite program. But not so with the oppressed peoples of Europe, with Pierre the Frenchman, for example, who lives under the heel of the Nazi boot. Pierre must wait for darkness. In the dead of night, he steals down into the cellar, through the secret door, and there he is, underground. That's where his radio is. There, underground, at the risk of his life, he gets information which tells him when the long-awaited invasion is coming and how to aid by destroying enemy installations, rails, bridges, factories. Through radio, underground, the oppressed learn the truth, learn of the coming invasion that will crush the heart of the enemy. To coordinate an invasion from the sea, on land, in the air, and yes, even underground, it takes radio. Admiral Radio is proud to be part of the coming invasion, just as Admiral was proud in pre-war days of its leadership as the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. The entire production facilities of Admiral's two great plants are devoted to victory. But Admiral gives you this assurance, when victory is ours, the skill and precision now going into weapons of war will be found in your new and better Admiral... America's smart set. Now, here once again is Doug Edwards. Massive Russian spearheads are pushing steadily forward today against retreating German troops in the southwestern Ukraine and in old Poland. Red armies have smashed within striking distance of three German escape railroads. Pushing on rapidly from captured Ilyntsi, 40 miles east of Zemarinka, one of General Vatutin's spearheads has brought the Odessa to Warsaw Railroad under attack. The cutting of this vital line of communication would force the Germans in the south 
to depend on secondary long way around railroads through Romania. Another Red Army group is less than 11 miles northeast of the junction town of Maranovka on the Belayat Sirkov to Smerya Railroad. And in addition, Vatutin's advance units have practically made the east west railway from Smerya to the Odessa to Warsaw line useless. Red Army troops are only 11 miles north of this line, which is the main German escape route across the southern Ukraine. Meanwhile, General Konev is developing his drive from captured Kirovograd. He's smashing at the rear of the German forces in the Dnieper Bend and increasing the threat to Krivoy Rog and Nikopol, the iron, coal, and manganese centers in the southeast. Red Army observers report that roads in the captured Kirovograd area are covered with smashed enemy guns, lorries, and crippled automobiles. To the northwest, Soviet columns in Old Poland are reported five miles east of the town of Sarny, capture of which would cut a fourth vital rail line which links the German armies to the north and south. American and British troops in the Allied Fifth Army in Italy have beaten off German counterattacks and reached a point within four miles of Casino, the important town which guards the road to Rome. Reports from the front say terrific mountain battles are now underway, battles unlike anything seen in this war since the Greeks fought Italians in Albania two years ago. American troops fighting with bayonets and hand grenades pushed the Germans out of their strong positions in the village of Justo, and they've now driven into the heights closer to Casino. Allied planes continue to hammer the continent. For this news and an interview with one of our fighting men, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Larry Lesseur reporting. In the past few months, this great aircraft carrier called Britain has become a concentration point for the fighting men of the United Nations. Sunburned men who conquered Africa confer over the map of Europe with those who drove out the Japs from the Aleutians. And here's a man who has seen the war in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. 32-year-old Colonel William J. Cummings of Lawrence, Kansas. He's better known to his boys in the 8th Air Force Fighter Command as Wild Bill Cummings when he leaves his Thunderbolt group over Europe. Cummings now escorts our liberators and fortresses to Germany in daylight. But not so long ago, he was fighting Japanese Zeros in the Pacific. Colonel Cummings, which do you consider the toughest theater of war, the Atlantic or the Pacific? Well, as an airman, there's not much doubt that the war is tougher here in Europe than it was out in the Pacific. The German planes are just as good, if not better, than the old Jap Zero. And I think the German pilot is more resolute. The Jap fights very hard on the ground, but in the air, the Jap will bluff out just as soon as anyone else. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But Colonel Cummings... I understand that although you're a fighter pilot, you've also fought on the ground against the Japs. How was that? Well, you remember when the Japs attacked the Philippines, we were pretty short of planes. By the time we were driven to Bataan, we only had a few left. We kept passing them and shuttling back and forth to men and now, bringing in supplies and ammunition. After a while, all our planes were out of action, and my squadron became infantrymen. We had rifles and pistols, and we fought skirmishes with the Jap infantry closing in on our soldiers in Bataan. Things went from bad to worse. Everybody had malaria, dysentery, and dengue fever. Then one day a liberator came from Australia, and 35 of us piled into it, and we flew to safety on the mainland. You were one of the lucky ones, weren't you? How many of your squadron got out of there, Colonel Cummings? Just nine out of the original 40. The rest of my friends are dead or prisoners of war. Some were killed on the ground, some were hit by bombs, some were shot down, and the rest are in prison camps. Hmm. Do you get any rest after that experience, Colonel Cummings? Yes, after making a few missions over New Guinea against Japanese Zeros, I went back to America. Joined a new fighter squadron and sent me over here. Oh, well, where would you rather be, here or in the Pacific? Living conditions are better over here, aren't they? Yes, they are, except for the cold. <laughs> well, how about food? That's better over here, isn't it, Colonel Cummings? Well, on the town, we had two meals a day, rice and sometimes a little canned salmon. Over here, it's Spam and Brussels sprouts. Well, I guess you'd settle for a steak and French fried. Sure would, Larry. But when this is over, I want to get back and fight the Japs. After you've been strafed and bombed and seen your friends die alongside you, war becomes very personal. I left a lot of good friends back there. Yes, I guess the war is more impersonal for our boys here in Europe. Most of them have never seen a German. They've never seen the cities their bombs destroy. Have you ever been in Europe yourself, Colonel Cummings? No, I never have, but I don't think it'll be long now. Germans are almost in the same position as we were in the Pacific two years ago. They're on a defensive. Yep, I guess they are, and I hope you'll keep them on the defensive for a long, long time. Thank you very much, Colonel Cummings. We return you now to CBS, New York. Here at home, our Army Air Force mechanics are now inspecting a captured German medium bomber, the famed Junker 88. For a report on just how this ship stacks up against our planes, Admiral Radio takes you to right field. Bill Slocum, Jr., reporting. 
sitting here on the flight line at Wright Field, is an interesting testimony to our Russian allies' powers of persuasion. It is a JU-88, a German twin-engine airplane that not too long ago sat on a flight line somewhere in Romania. A young Nazi aviator owned that JU-88, and after giving much thought to the certain basic inconsistencies of the master race doctrine, he came to a decision which was, in effect, nuts to this. He therefore promptly climbed into his plane and flew to Allied territory surrendering himself and his plane intact. Being a very observing young Nazi, he was smart enough to surrender to the British, even though they were farther away than the Russians. This plane is now at Wright Field, headquarters of the Air Force's Materiel Command, where daring young American test pilots are learning exactly what makes it click. It is long and anemic-looking except for its head, which is fairly large. It looks like a garden snake trying to swallow a golf ball. Three or four Germans get into that bulbous nose up front, but it's a cinch two of them must be junior Germans. Captain Gus Lundquist, a young man from Chicago, has with several other test pilots at Wright Field been flying this plane. The captain's passion for the JU-88 is somewhat restrained, but he did consent to talk about it with me today. Captain, what do you think of it? Confidentially, Mr. Slocum, it isn't a very good airplane. As an all-purpose plane, it's good. It can be used as a bomber, a fighter, a reconnaissance job, or a dive bomber. But, and this is the important but, she isn't any too good in any one phase of the different types of... Uh... How about the gadgets on her, Captain? She carries good instruments and a couple of buttons that are something. One button, when pushed, sets off a charge that destroys a bomb bay mechanism. How'd you find out about that button? The hard way, Mr. Slocum. We pushed it. One of the boys got hurt a little bit. How about the other button? That blows off the entire tail assembly. We discovered that right after we found out about the bomb bays, but not by pushing anything, so the tail's still on. What do we have that's like the JU-88? Our A-20 is something like her, but the A-20 is faster, better armed and armored, and carries more bombs. Anything that junkers can do, we have one or more planes that can do it better. You and the Nazi pilot who surrendered her seem to have basically the same opinions of the 88. Could you say a kind word about her at all? Well, Mr. Slocum, she flew across the Atlantic. And that is a thought, Captain Lundquist. Thanks for helping us give a picture of the German JU-88, now close to obsolescence. But as any merchant mariner or Navy man can tell you, she was a great gal when she had it, and she really had it. Now back to Admiral Radio in New York. This week, the Germans made little effort to minimize the disaster of facing their troops in Russia and their troubles at home. For a direct report from one of Europe's listening posts, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Madrid. Glenn Stadler reporting. As Nazi Marshal Rommel ranged up and down the Channel Coast checking his anti-invasion preparations, all of Europe, and especially Holland, Belgium, and France, became visibly more restless. This condition is everywhere reflected in the German-controlled newspapers. Notices of executions of patriots are increasing daily. A typical one from Le Journal of Lyon announces that three Frenchmen were shot by a Gestapo firing squad on December 28th. The charge was favoring the enemy. But despite reprisals and 3,000 arrests each week in France alone, anti-Nazi groups become larger, better organized, and more daring. In Valenciennes, a dozen armed men led by a man brandishing a gun in each hand broke into the jail, took 50,000 francs, and liberated five companions. In a running gun battle, one was killed. The others escaped, some on bicycles. Thus having failed to quell resistance, the Nazis have reverted again to what they must think is a clever trick, but has had little or no success. It's a periodic appeal to surrender firearms and promises immunity from punishment, even though possession of guns and explosives is illegal. The catch is, of course, that the minute someone is foolish enough to comply, he's arrested. Yes, they promised immunity, but only for the period specified. The person is guilty of having the arms in the previous overlapping period covered by an identical law prescribing the death penalty. German papers carry none of this type of news because the propaganda ministry believes that people might get the wrong idea about life in the occupied countries. Hitler's own Fokuscher Beobachter features blasts at the Allies and and laboriously written explanations on why the Red Army is in Poland now. The Nazi journals, however, do carry hundreds of death notices daily And there obviously is a large backlog because many are dated as of six months ago. One recently announced the death on the Russian front of a soldier named John Dillinger. 
Another in black border and big type bore only the name Adolf. This is Grant Stabber in Madrid, returning you to Admiral Radio in New York. Our Pacific forces continue to strike hard at the enemy in the central and southern area. For a summary of the latest developments in that war zone, Admiral Radio takes you after a brief pause to CBS Pearl Harbor, Webley Edwards reporting. In the Pacific, United States Marines on New Britain have pushed a mile and three quarters south of Silimati Point. There's heavy fighting. Rabaul has been raided for the sixth time in six days. Australians are driving up the Huan Peninsula and are close to a juncture with United States forces who last week landed at Sidor. The marshals have been bombed again. I'm now able to tell you that I have just spent some time with the Marines of Tarawa. Earlier, I flew to a Pacific island and, to my surprise, landed squarely in the midst of them, just as their convoys were arriving. I say to my surprise because outside of official circles, nobody knew where they were. And there'd been considerable speculation as to where the Marines would be taken for rest and rehabilitation after their occupation of Tarawa. That arrival of the Marines, back from one of the grimmest, bloodiest actions of all the history of this fighting corps, was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. They came off their troop ships in every stage of disarray. They still wore their mottled camouflage fighting outfits, those who still had them. But many were in shorts and old suits of underwear, and some wore improvised wraparounds. They brought much of their equipment back with them, and it had the look of well-worn battle gear. Only equipment that's been in real fighting can have quite that appearance. They had some of their wounded with them, and some who had died on the way home. They were tough, hard-bitten, and soberly serious. They were men who'd learned about war at Guadalcanal before they found out about hell at Tarawa. And yet, being Marines, there was a jauntiness about them that even their disheveled clothing could not hide. This was no gala landing, nor was there any of the spick-and-span parade ground stuff about this homecoming. But even so, as they poured down the gangways and stepped again on solid earth, the Marines raised their heads and straightened their shoulders and looked just square in the eye as if to say, well, that was that. They had trophies, naturally. Bundles of Jap paper, money, Jap flags, and all the dozens of things that fighting men pick up on battlefields to take back to the girlfriend of the family. They went to a plane in a higher region of the island and set about making themselves a great camp. It's a real undertaking to set up a camp for as many men as they had and do it from the ground up, but they thought nothing of it. They're there now, getting some rest. They are restless, though, and I think they would welcome action at once if they could get it. When you have seen the Marines back from Tarawa... It makes you glad they are on our side. It would be very unpleasant to have to meet these Marines in battle anywhere. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor, returning you to Admiral Radio in New York. Two Army nurses who helped care for our wounded soldiers in the South Pacific are now back in this country. For their story, Admiral Radio again takes you to CBS Washington, Don Pryor reporting. I met a couple of girls yesterday out at the Army's Walter Reed General Hospital. They had a story to tell, so here they are. They are Lieutenant Marguerite Cooney of Worcester, Massachusetts, and Lieutenant Helen Burns of Wallingford, Connecticut, both Army nurses. They just got back to the States after 22 months abroad. How'd you happen to get in the Army, girls? We both joined through the Red Cross in 1940. We volunteered for one year. That was Lieutenant Burns. You say you volunteered for one year, but it's well over three years now. Well, the war changed things. We got our riders to sail right after Pearl Harbor, January 1942. Well, did you know where you were going? Incidentally, that was Lieutenant Cooney that time. No, we didn't know. Well, most of us guessed that we were going to Australia. That seemed like the most logical place. And you were right? Yes, but we only stayed there a week, and then we went to New Caledonia. Had you ever heard of New Caledonia before? No, we didn't know there was such a place in the world until we set foot in it. Uh, had you, uh, uh, was it exciting after you got there? It was at first. We were expecting trouble when we landed. We went ashore in fatigue uniforms with tin helmets and everything, but nothing happened. Uh, where were you, in a city? I wouldn't call it that. We're in Numea for a while. That's the biggest town on the island, but it's just a dirty little village. We stayed there a few weeks, though, and then our whole outfit moved to 120 miles north. And that was some ride. It took us 10 hours in a truck. Well, where was that? What town? No town at all. We were right out in the woods. Well, how about living accommodations? We lived in tents for eight months. Our hospital was a tent, too. And we had to carry all our water from a brook. We bathed in the brook, too, and we had a little pool there screened off with tenting. Sort of rugged, but it does sound like fun. It was. 
But, of course, we got pretty homesick now and then. After the first eight months, we got the natives to build us some grass houses. You could have a house built for about $25. They were all right, too, until I got too full of rats and mice and things. Did you handle very many casualties? Not for quite a while. Finally, all the boys who were with us at first were sent to Guadalcanal. But we had plenty of casualties later. After 14 months, we moved again, not far from Numea. We received many from the New Georgia and Russell Islands. Were they good patients, mostly? Most of them were very good and very appreciated. Speaking of uh, getting back in the States now, after 22 months, how did it feel to get back? Wonderful. It's funny how the little things impress you most, like bathtubs and being able to walk into a store and buy something. But the thing that surprised me most was the fact that rationing wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. My friends had written about how terrible the shortages were. <laughs> and how about you, Lieutenant Cooney? What impressed you most? Women running streetcars, buses, and so many of them in work clothes. I'd heard about all those things, but I really wasn't prepared for it. Uh, do you want to go back out there? Yes, I do. I was terribly anxious to get back here, but now I feel kind of restless and lost. I suppose I'll get used to it after a while. Yes, I suppose you will after a while. That was Lieutenant Marguerite Cooney and Lieutenant Helen Burns, Army nurses just back from the South Pacific. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. The Chungking Radio has broadcast a note to Jap Premier Tojo to keep him up to date on the latest figures on American airplane production. Dear Tojo, the broadcast said, for your information, for your further information... The United States produced a bombing plane every four minutes, every day, 24 hours a day during December. And then the broadcast gave the figures. A record number of 8,800 planes in December to bring the American total for the year to almost 86,000 planes. The Chinese broadcast concluded, start counting, Tojo. And now once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Does your radio give you the same flawless perception and carefree enjoyment it did when new? If not, the trouble may be some easily made adjustment that you can do yourself. To conserve your busy Admiral dealer's time, Admiral has prepared a clearly illustrated home checkup chart showing you how to correct minor difficulties in reception. For example, here is one of the 20 suggestions made. Make sure your antenna lead-in wire hasn't become frayed by rubbing. The exposed wire, when wet by rain, sleet or snow, and blown against the building, may be grounded in poor reception results. The Admiral Home Checkup Chart is designed purely as an aid and time saver for your Admiral dealer and will not help you to correct major troubles or structural failures. Your Admiral dealer is the man to call in such cases because of his knowledge and equipment. But for your copy of the Admiral Home Checkup Chart, ask your dealer or address a card or letter to Admiral Radio in care of this station. Thanks to huge increases in farm production, America has enough food to satisfy the basic requirements of good health and sound nutrition and still meet the food demands of war. But we do not have all the food we want and can afford. Rationing is the democratic way to share and share alike. It is a vital wartime necessity, but rationing is not enough. Prices must be kept from skyrocketing. Black markets must be stamped out. Fifteen million Americans have signed the Home Front Pledge, which is... I will pay no more than top legal prices. I will not accept rationed goods without giving up ration points. Living up to this pledge will assure a fair share for all. And that's the right way, the democratic way. Remember, food fights for freedom. The appearance of Army personnel on this program does not constitute an endorsement of our product for the Army, as the Army does not endorse any product. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is Warren Sweeney speaking coast to coast for the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11.